everyone, this is chapter 12, part 2. In this part, we'll talk about market power and barriers to entry. Okay, so entry of new firms into a market erodes market power of existing firms by increasing the number of substitutes. Okay, so if you're in the restaurant industry, you live in this town, this city A. Okay, it's a small city and you are the only Thai restaurant. I do love Thai food. Okay. And so let's say you're doing really good, right? And you open a Thai restaurant. It's super busy. Guess what? Some other people see you doing really good. There are no barriers to entry. They come in and they can completely replicate your food. Okay. Then that will increase number of substitutes and it will cut on your market power. Okay. So a firm can possess a high degree of market power only when strong barriers to entry exist. Okay. So in the restaurant business, there's actually no high level of market power. However, if I had a very specialized restaurant that is very differentiated, not easy to replicate, I have a higher degree of market power. However, because the entry is not blocked, the entry barriers are not strong, I still will never have very uh, strong market power. So barriers to entry um, are conditions that make it difficult for new firms to enter a market in which economic profits are being earned. Okay, so let's talk about common entry barriers. The first one are the barriers created by government. These are patents, licenses, exclusive franchises, and also actually copyright. Copyright. Okay. So let's talk about patents. So let's say you came up uh, with a new medication. You have a small pharmaceutical company. You came up with a, uh, with a new medication for um, blood pressure. Okay. And it is superior to all other blood pressure meds in the market. And then you apply for patents from date of application and approval is 20 years. But first 10 years, you basically have to pass all the trial, uh, trials, FDA approval, food drug administration approvals, all that stuff for 10 years. So you do have maybe 10 years to recoup the benefits of your years of investment on this medication. Okay, so that's why, for instance, Prozac. Prozac was a um, medication. It's a medication for mood disorders. So their sales went down by 80% once once the patents expired. So that for that period, 20 years, you become a monopolist. Licenses. This is licensing for, for instance, attorneys bar association. Right? You pass the bar exam or you are a dentist you have to be licensed you even if you you know you don't need to be a medical professional even if you are a esthetician beautician nail technician you have to have a license this is to protect people from incompetent practitioners and also exclusive franchises government basically tells okay you're going to fix the potholes the holes on the road in the city it gives uh some rights to certain companies to fix these pot potholes copyrights apply to creative work second one is the economies of scale so basically economies of scale means there is space for only one company in the market okay so i'm going to give you an example for instance if you look at major um nfl teams right you don't find five teams in one city. For instance, Houston, right? It's a big city, very big city, has one NFL team. So do we have NFL team in Austin? Austin doesn't have one because population was Austin is smaller than Houston. We don't know what will happen in the future, but you need to have a big market for these kind of things. When long run average cost declines over a wide range of output relative to demand for the product, there might not be room. There, there may not be room for a new firm to enter the industry on a large enough scale to compete. So imagine this is the scale, right? It looks like this long run average cost curve, long run average cost curve. This is the cost. 
So to be able to lower your cost, you need to be really big. For instance, you need to fill your stadium capacity of 100,000 people, right? And you can't fill 100,000 seats in a city with 80,000 people. That's just not going to work. So these NFL teams, that's why they will go to big cities. For instance, Houston, millions of people, okay? Uh, how about NBA teams in Texas? We have one in, right, San Antonio. Do we have two teams in San Antonio? No, because it is not big enough to actually uh, have two teams, okay? So the same idea applies to the cable service i had in mississippi i mentioned this before i lived in hattiesburg mississippi college town there was only one cable company okay because the infrastructure you put in the money investment you put in to provide cable and internet for this town only justify existence of one company okay even if another company enters the customers are taken and they need to invest a lot. The third one is essential input barriers. One firm basically is controlling a crucial input in the production process. Example, we have Alcoa. This is Aluminum Corporation of America. Okay. They are publicly traded. You may see their name, you know, in stock market and everything. And they are uh, very big players in aluminum production production why because because of this they own almost all bauxite mines what is bauxite we need bauxite to produce aluminum and in order to produce aluminum without bauxite is just to grab scrap aluminum which sounds really interesting and then recycle it and then get bauxite and then produce okay so therefore by alcohol controlling lots of bauxite mines becomes a monopoly another example a dutch company called the De beers they owned 80 percent of all diamond diamond mines okay in the world in the 1900s okay so if you own 80% of diamond mines, you have access to the main ingredient of what you are producing. This is, you know, fine jewelry company. Next one is brand loyalty. So this is strong customer allegiance to existing firms that may keep new firms from finding enough buyers to make entry worthwhile. So brand loyalty, so how does it work? So I am going to ask you how many cars have you had? How many cars? And how many different brands of cars, brands did you make and models did you have? So let me start. I have only owned Nissans. I do. I did have trucks back in the days, but they were same brand too. But I switched to Nissans for SUVs, crossovers, and I'm still sticking with Nissan. Okay, so this is called brand loyalty. It's really hard to change people's preferences. Okay. If you want an electric car and you bought a Tesla, you really loved it, maybe you'll stick to Tesla. Okay. Another one is consumer. Another common barrier to entry is consumer luck in. Potential entrants can be deterred if they believe high switching costs make previous consumption decisions very costly to change. So this, for instance, happened to me with home security so i do have home security what i did is uh, they put like equipment sensors i'm throwing some sensors a camera you know they give you a camera in the front yard backyard all that these are sensor sensors so they i signed a contract i bought them on a plan right i'm paying 20 dollars a month for these sensors and everything and interestingly enough, if I switch, I have to pay, let's say, $600 remaining balance of these sensors uh, for canceling. Therefore, it's making it hard for consumers to switch. Okay. Switching costs are incurred when consumers, uh, incurred by consumers when they switch to a new or different products or services. This happens also, let's say you bought a machine 
and it works with a cartridge you bought a lot of cartridges so if you switch you won't be able to use it next one network externalities so this occurs when benefit or utility of consumer drives from consuming a good depends positively on the number of other consumers who use the good so this definition i'm like what let me give you an example. So imagine something that is only useful if others use it too. For instance, Microsoft Microsoft Word software, okay? Imagine in the world nobody else uses it. You are the only one. You are the only one who has it. You type the homework, okay? This is the homework. And you emailed it to your professor. And your professor took receive the email attachment and your professor says i can't open it and you're like what what is going on or you save something in pdf format sent it to your professor you are the only one who can open this document nobody else in the world uses so any product that another example is for instance ice cream has got nothing to do with network externalities because ice cream is useful if only i eat it Actually, it becomes not useful if others eat it. So, network externalities occur if the usefulness of good is there when many others are using it. Example is also social media. I don't use much, but Facebook, right? My parents use it a lot. Let's say you are the only person on Facebook. No other human human being is on Facebook. So you posted a cute picture of your dog. I'm going to draw a dog. Okay, nobody liked, nobody did anything because nobody else is there. How is it useful? Social media, Facebook, PDF, auctions, um, eBay auctions. If nobody's there, nobody's going to buy. Um, uh, what else? Instagram? Nobody on TikTok. Okay, I'm just talking about all these social media. So, useful because the usefulness of a product increases with next network external. If there are network externalities, usefulness of a product will increase if there are people. You want to be in a group that is used by many people. So, I let's say I'm a software engineer. I came up with something similar to PDF. Well, PDF has already... Adobe PDF has already occupied the market. How am I going to take over that market? Okay, so that is the idea of network externalities. And number seven, sunk costs. Entry costs, which are sunk costs, can serve as a barrier if they are so high that the manager cannot expect to earn enough future profit to make entry worthwhile. For instance, I want to start a construction company. I want to focus on building bridges not regular bridges suspended suspended bridges over water oh good luck you bet you better get a world-class engineering team there are some korean companies you can actually count these japanese companies are not bad usa there's you know a couple of them not many and also in israel i believe there is one company so it's so costly to get started, right? With this st building bridges. Or I want to start a new uh, smartphone. You know, I want to start a smartphone company. We already have big players in the market. Apple, Android, Samsung, okay? Uh, how are you going to break into this market? You need to get a lot of engineers, designers, lots of stuff. So... These were the barriers to entries and next we'll talk about demand and marginal revenue for monopolists and we will talk about the demand curve we started talking about in part one. So quantity price, next time we're talking about this. See you then.